um, Dr. Scott is, um, his name is well known throughout the world because California Community College is the world's largest high education system. To be a leader of that, I know that uh, they are, when I was at AACC, they were talking about how many international delegations have come to the United States to look at the system of community college. And California is one of the must stops um, to really lead a system of these magnitude and complication is not an easy thing. Now, probably California system is one of the most complicated ones. I don't pretend to understand everything. So I'm here to listen to Dr. Scott as well. And I think I've asked Dr. Scott uh, to focus his talk today on his experience um, from the president of the legislature. And particularly today, we're talking about policy. So I know he has a lot to tell you. And in case you don't capture everything, Rena is recording everything for us. And we'll have that posted for you on Titania. Dr. Scott. Thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Curry. Uh, well, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you for that very warm introduction. I'll try to live up to it. In fact, uh, Dean Joe, I'll just have you go around with me and introduce me. <laughs> <laughs> you do such a good job. Uh, but uh, it is really exciting for me to share with you uh, about my experience both in the legislature and in community colleges. Uh, uh, I'm a great fan of the community colleges. Um, she pointed out I began first as the chief academic officer at Orange Coast College, and then I served as president of both Cypress College and Pasadena City College. So uh, those have been were great experiences for me. And then, of course, I was the chancellor of the system, and I also was in the legislature. Uh, I thought a little bit about this today, and so I do have a handout here that is, uh, that is for the, uh, actually it's just an outline of the things I'm going to cover today, and uh, it's, it doesn't include everything I'm going to say, I'm going to make sure I gave out enough, I've got plenty. There's a little bit on, it's a front and back, so I put it so we can save a little paper. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, uh, and, and by the way, I want you to feel free to ask questions as I go along. Uh, I'm not a person who believes that the best way to learn is a monologue. Uh, I believe in dialogue, and uh, I want to answer questions you may have. Uh, and uh, I'm going to cover a lot of ground. And in covering ground, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, touch on policy at the campus level. I'm going to talk about policy at the state level. I'm going to talk about policy at the state system level. And, uh, but uh, you ought to feel free to ask me about any question you want to ask. Um, I uh, commend you for uh, your doctoral studies. I was fortunate enough to uh, receive a PhD degree from Claremont Graduate University many years ago. In fact, I'm serving as a scholar in residence there now. And uh, so uh, I always encourage uh, individuals to pursue additional uh, education. And uh, like most of you, uh, I was uh, a professional when I pursued the doctor. Uh, I was not, uh, you know, I didn't have the finances to simply go directly from a bachelor's degree to a master's degree to a PhD degree without some kind of help and uh, a lot of support from a family. Um, what are we talking about when we talk about policy? Well, I looked up one of the definitions. It says, of course, our principle of action proposed by government party, business, or individual. Sometimes we can talk about a system or a code or a strategy. All of those might be synonyms for uh, what a, uh, a policy is. But sometimes, you know, 
we can talk about policy even at a family level. We may say, for instance, it's our policy in this family to be a, a hospital, or it's our policy uh, to have a lot of love for extended family. Or, by that, we just mean it's an accepted practice. It probably hasn't been written down, uh, but we talk about it as a policy. But policy is very frequently actually written as a code. Uh, so we have national policy, we have state policy, we have uh, college policy, and it so happens uh, that I've had experience at all levels. Um, I, uh, as was pointed out, uh, I began my career as a college teacher. Uh, I then became an administrator, and uh, I enjoyed administration, by the way, if you're in administration or aspire to be in administration, I think that's a, a very noble calling. Uh, on the other hand, I, I certainly don't uh, deprecate someone who chooses to spend his or her entire life as a teacher. Uh, after all, it is teaching is the very heart of an institution. That's what we're all about, is passing on the knowledge and experience of teachers uh, on to students. And whether we're an administrator or a classified staff member or whatever, it really the whole thing circles around the student and the improvement of the life of students. And uh, I'm a great fan of higher education. Uh, just economically, all the studies indicate that the uh, greater degrees, the more degrees that you have, uh, generally speaking, the, your income is going to increase. Uh, the, uh, I sometimes talk to high school students, and I say to them, you want to earn a million dollars? And they kind of perk up, and I say, well, that's the difference in the lifetime earnings between someone with just a high school diploma and someone with a bachelor's degree. And uh, that's not a guarantee. Uh, sometimes the disparity between a high school diploma and a college degree is not as great as a million dollars, but sometimes it's much greater than a million dollars. Furthermore, the unemployment rate among college graduates is always less than the unemployment rate of those who, certainly those who didn't finish high school and those who simply have a high school diploma. So I'm a great fan of higher education and what it does. I'm a great fan because it did a lot for me. Uh, I was born in a small West Texas town, about 10,000 people, and went off to college. And I was fortunate that a couple of professors said to me, Jack, you ought to think about going on to graduate school. Well, to tell you the truth, I hadn't thought about that before. I, I would just thought, you know, I'm going over here and I'm going to get a college degree and, and uh, I'll go on from there. But that, that I listened to what they had to say, and so as a result, I pursued that. So uh, here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about policy. How does it originate? And further, not only how has it originated, but how is it implemented? If you're in administration, you have more to do with the implementation of policy. Uh, after all, at a college, for instance, it is the Board of Trustees that ultimately codifies policy. You may suggest the policy, but if it's written and codified, it's normally done at the Board of Trustees level. But you will have a hand in making policy, and you'll certainly have a hand in implementing policy. Uh, and you'll discover to your dismay, if you don't implement it correctly, you may get into a little trouble. Uh, if we have a policy relating to tenure and uh, you disobey that policy, you may find yourself in a courtroom. And uh, so policy is, is terribly important. And uh, I'm going to talk about it at three different levels. And uh, perhaps the one that I may emphasize more is the legislative level because that's the one that I'm more familiar with than perhaps you are. Uh, and uh, certainly you're in, 
you're very interested and, and very involved in uh, policy at the college level. And certainly, most of my life was spent in higher education, uh, both as a student, as a teacher, and as an administrator. Um, let's talk a little bit about policy at the college level. Some of the policies that are at the college level are determined at the state. For instance, Fullerton College doesn't have a different tenure policy than Orange Coast College. That's already been determined by the state of California. Uh, we have something called the 50% rule in community colleges. If you're not an administrator, you might not have heard of it, but probably you have. And certainly you'll be called upon to implement that. That just simply says that 50% of the budget of a college is to be spent on instruction. And, and that's, a, that's a statewide policy. That's not simply a policy at one place and then the other. Uh, disciplinary policies sometimes are established at, a, at the state level. For instance, uh, there are some things that if you are guilty of, that a college has no choice but to dismiss you. There are certain sex and drug crimes that when you're arrested for those crimes, the college is obligated to immediately suspend you. They suspend you with pay. But if you're found guilty, then the college has no choice. They didn't make the rule. The rule's been made at the state level. And if you're found guilty of that, then the college has no opportunity other than to dismiss you. So uh, that's a, so there are re rules and regulations that are made at the state level. And uh, I'll talk to you a little bit later about how that happens. And uh, you may find those rules and regulations uh, frustrating. Uh, you may not agree with them, uh, but let, let me tell you a little rule of thumb, and that is just go ahead and accept them because you've got to live with them. Familiar with a serenity prayer that is said in the Alcoholic Anonymous that goes something like this Lord, uh, grant me uh, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So, sometimes uh, when you have rules and regulations, that have been imposed by the state, then you don't have any, you may have, there may be, there may be procedures or processes in which you implement them, but you have to abide by them. And if you don't abide by them, then, uh, of course, uh, you'll find yourself probably in a courtroom, and whoever is the plaintiff is, is going to win. And if they can cite a, a state rule uh, that, that you have violated. But sometimes there are Policies that are simply involved in that particular college. Often, as you'll note in that outline, I've mentioned collective bargaining. I think all of you are aware of what collective bargaining is. In fact, every community college district has collective bargaining. Uh, I remember when collective bargaining came in uh, to community colleges. And of course, as you know, a collective, collective bargaining is simply the process by which a teacher's union or a classified staff union or perhaps even a smaller union negotiates with the Board of Trustees an agreement. Now, that doesn't mean that the union itself can dictate what that agreement is. They propose there's negotiation that goes on, and if there's an agreement that's reached, that becomes part of the collective bargaining agreement. You may have collectively bargained. Um, how are you going to treat adjunct faculty, for instance? Some districts, for instance, uh, uh, may say that uh, adjunct faculty assignments are uh, given on a seniority basis, and others may not have that. Um, 
collectively bargained normally indicates what the salary is at certain levels. You're all familiar with the process of determining whether there's going to be a COLA granted, cost of living increase, uh, whether there's going to be certain health benefits, that's negotiated. Uh, and as health care costs increase, that's often a point of real contention within a district. Uh, so there are all sorts of things uh, that can be negotiated. Now there's some things that are not subject to negotiation. Certainly changing state rules uh, are not subject to negotiation. But so there are certain uh, rules and policies that are developed at a campus level. Now the ultimate power of governance is in the hands of an elected board of trustees. Is that a, a good system? Well, people could argue about that. You know, some states have appointed board of trustees rather than elected board of trustees. In the state of California, there are approximately 70 community college districts covering about 112 colleges. And uh, these uh, are in turn governed by an elected board of trustees. For instance, here in Fullerton, it's called the North Orange County Community College District. It has two colleges, Cypress College and Fullerton College. And this, that board of trustees makes the determination of the policies that govern that particular community college district. All of that within the within the laws of the state of California. They're not free to, uh, they're free, for instance, to select the president. They're free, in fact, to appoint all the personnel, although normally they delegate the appointing of personnel uh, to those uh, administrators and faculty members and classified staff members within the college. But they, in turn, are recommended to the Board of Trustees and they, in turn, validate or invalidate the recommendation uh, of the staff and the faculty. So that's a little bit about policies at the, at the local level, at the college level. I'm wondering now if it wouldn't be good for me to stop here and entertain any kind of questions you may have about local policies, about policies maybe on your campus. Yes. Our um, board of trustees typically, I'm fairly new to higher ed, so sure. are they typically people who somehow work their way up in the community college, or are they just from... They're normally lay people. Uh, in fact, they can't be employees of the district. Uh, they could be employees of another district. For instance, there are community college trustees that happen to be faculty members in another community college outside that district. But trustees cannot be employees of the, of the district. Now, other systems of higher education are governed, governed in different ways. Um, for instance, California State University is governed by a board of trustees mm -hmm. at the statewide level. And a chancellor answers to that board of trustees and the presidents of the individual campuses answer then to the chancellor. But the board of trustees of the California State University govern the entire state university. The board of regents governs the University of California. They're appointed. They're, you're exactly In right. California, the They're both of, appointed by the governor. And, uh, but they're approved uh, by the Senate, by the state Senate. And, and there, there are cases in which a region is appointed and not approved. Uh, they, have, they can serve for, the governor ha has the right to appoint, and they serve for a year without approval. But then they have to be approved. Yes? So one of the things that I have learned in 
the short time that I've been in this program is that the community colleges have done a disservice to themselves by not working together on policy issues. And, and I don't know if, that, if I need to expand more on that impression that I have. But I'm wondering if you think there could ever be a solution where they're working more closely together on policy issues so that they become stronger. Because right now we seem to be the stepchild and, and UC and CSU systems get more funding. And to me it's obvious that they're just not working together. Okay. Well, I, I'll talk a little bit about that particularly when I get to the legislative level. Now I will say this though. Uh, Right now, like for instance, in the upcoming budget, the community colleges are funded, received a greater COLA, a greater amount of money, than either the UC or the CSU. So uh, it is true that the community colleges, in some respects, have been a stepchild. But I would say in the last maybe 10 years, uh, that has not been as true. Uh, even at the national level, you know, President Obama recently, for instance, proposed that students would be able to go to community colleges free. Now, frankly, that's not going to happen tomorrow, uh, particularly with a divided government as we now have at the national level. But it's interesting that that's been proposed as a discussion point. Uh, it is true that in many cases, various segments of the community college have not always worked together. And I'll talk about that, particularly when I get to talk about a bill that I introduced and was passed into law that gave community college funding. Yes? Do you see a difference in the way that uh, especially <clears throat> teachers or staff are treated in a multi-site uh, district as opposed to a single-site district? Well, uh, I don't know that I see the faculties treated differently. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of, of the, what we call multi-college districts. Uh, and frankly, I've worked in both. Uh, I was president at Cypress College, which is a multi-college district. Uh, I was president at Pasadena City College, which is a single college district. From the standpoint of a presidency, I preferred the single college district because I answered directly to the Board of Trustees, whereas in a multi-college district I answered to a chancellor who in turn answered to the Board of Trustees. And, 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 but that's, that, was, that had to do with presidencies. I've seen colleges that are outstanding colleges in a multi-college district. And I've seen outstanding colleges in a single college district. So I don't think it's the one thing that determines uh, the quality of a college. Uh, sometime, the, the largest district in the state of California is Los Angeles Community College District. It has nine colleges. There is some problem sometimes in a bureaucracy that large. And uh, I felt like when I was like president of Pasadena City College, uh, it gave me the opportunity to be right there on campus and then to answer directly to the board of trustees. So, you know, that, that, that what happened, what, what, normally the growth of, of, of multi-college districts, here's the way it happened. It was originally a single college district, but as the population grew, I was true in the Coast District, uh, the original college in the Coast District was Orange Coast College. Orange Coast College, I think, was founded in 1947 or something like that. But then Orange County had tremendous growth. And so the second college that was established was Golden West College, which was in Huntington Beach. Orange Coast College was in Costa Mesa. The third college that was established in that district over which uh, Dr. Curry served as president before she was chancellor of the entire district was Coastline College, which had an innovative approach of being a, a college with 
uh, a, a lot of televised and online instruction, and also in a variety of locations. So, uh, but uh, I, I, it is true that a faculty member in a multi-college district that, that you have to have a quality. In other words, you, you don't have a different, uh, I don't think, a different salary schedule in, say, at Fullerton College and at Cypress College because the, the, the negotiated agreement is district-wide, not uh, college-wide. Uh, but there could be a lot of debate as to which is the more effective college administration, but I'm just, uh, I'm just telling you how the whole thing got started, and I think it got started more. The state of California was divided up into community mm -hmm. college districts, uh, and they have their lines, as you know. In other words, here in Orange County, uh, there's, of course, the North Orange District, the Coast Community College District, the uh, Rancho Santiago District. Uh, the South Orange Community College District, and all of them started as one college. But they became multi-college districts because of, of the growth. Uh, you know, and, and of course Orange County had phenomenal growth uh, in the post-war period, post-World War II period. Uh, well, that's a little bit of a discussion of the local level, and we, we can come back to that. Uh, but let me now move to the state level uh, and talk about policy at that level. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I, as a, uh, as both a, a teacher and an administrator in higher education, got into politics. I sometimes say, well, I started off as a teacher, was a college president, and then I was a politician. I said, my life has been a steady deterioration. <laughs> uh, and it was kind of an interesting uh, way I got into politics. Um, I was at Pasadena City College, and I had been offered the opportunity to uh, be a distinguished professor of higher education at Pepperdine University. And that was, a, that was appealing to me. I was thinking about, you know, I'd been a college president uh, for 17 years, and, and so just to kind of sit and teach, you know, I had a little bit of that ivory tower appeal. So I was going to do that, but in my area, the San Gabriel Valley, the Pasadena area, had always been represented um, by Republicans. But the demographics in the area was changing to some degree. Uh, there was a growth, certainly, in the Latino population and in the Asian population. More and more people who worked in the entertainment industry, who tend to vote Democratic, were moving into the area. And uh, it was, at that time, pretty evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. And so, some local political activists, uh, I had not uh, taken part in partisan politics, frankly, because I was president of a college, and I didn't think it was appropriate. I did take a stand, oh, about five or ten years before that on Prop 187, which I thought was uh, damaging to, to education, uh, stating that immigrant children uh, uh, were going to be denied education, and there was also a denial of medical benefits. And, and so that I thought, uh, you know, I felt strongly uh, opposed to that measure. So personally, I was registered as a Democrat, and, and had been for years. But uh, I had not uh, taken part. Well. These activists came to me and they said, you know, we need somebody who uh, is respected in the community. I would assume that they thought I was. <laughs> and they said, we need somebody who perhaps could also attract some Republican votes. 
And so we, they, he said, we've all talked and we've said that we think you ought to run for the assembly. And my wife and I went to this meeting of these three individuals who talked to us, representing a group of people. And uh, I said, well, I don't know that I'm going to do that. Politics is a contact sport, if you don't know it. And I knew that I'd have to raise money, and I knew that I'd have to. And I also knew that I would be attacked. I mean, that's the nature of politics. But the more I thought about it, the more it kind of appealed to me from the standpoint of education policy. You know, I could, I could make a difference in, in education policy. And Dr. Perry was kind enough to say that I could represent the community colleges. And so, anyway, I decided to do it. So, uh, it, was a, it wasn't an easy task, I can tell you. If you ever think about running for office, you better be prepared to work hard because you've got to knock on doors, raise money, and, and then you have all the things that go with running for office. And I was elected. Uh, oh, also, the incumbent was well, not terribly popular. That also got the watch. Uh, and uh, so I won by 53% to 44%. So I started this new career. I felt like a college freshman when I went up there. And, uh, I had never held elective office, so it wasn't like I was a city council member or a school board member. So I did get involved, and I, and I found that I could do some things. I was eventually the chair of the Education Committee in the Senate, and as Dr. Curry mentioned, I was able to author a lot of bills. And I didn't just author bills on education. I carried bills on insurance, on adoption, for instance. Four of my 11 grandchildren are adopted, and so I had some strong feelings about that. I carried bills on gun safety. That didn't endure me to the NRA, but nevertheless, I carried those bills. And I carried quite a number of bills, but I did carry a lot of bills on education. So what's, what's, what's uh, going into the state government? What's it like? Well, of course, the state government is patterned very much after the national government. They have a judicial branch, an executive branch, and a legislative branch. The executive branch includes the governor and uh, those officers such as attorney general and uh, treasurer and so forth. The judicial branch, as you know, is the judges and it goes all the way up to the California State Supreme Court. And the legislative branch is, you have two branches, the assembly which has 80 members and the senate which has 40 members. And so I served in the assembly for four years. I, when I originally ran, I thought I was just going to be there for uh, six years. And then I, as a result of that, I decided to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and uh, run for the Senate because the state senator vacated his seat to run for Congress, and he was successful. So I ran for the Senate and I was elected and I served as the chair of the Education Committee in the Senate. Okay, how does the state government work? Well, I'll give you a little primer, a little small nutshell of how it works. A bill is introduced. Let's say that I decide to introduce a bill. And it first is then recommended to a committee. There are maybe 15 or 20 standing committees. Agriculture, criminal law, water, you know, health care, a whole lot of committees. So let's say I introduce a bill in education that goes to the education committee. If I'm a senator, it goes to the education committee in the Senate. And if it gets out of the committee, then it goes to the floor of the Senate. And the Senate then votes on it. When you're on the floor, you introduce your own bill. And the senators have every right to 
disagree with, and frequently do. Oh, by the way, the public has the right, when it's in committee, to testify if they want to. If they want to go up there and testify, they can testify against the bill or for the bill. And it's pretty important as to who you get lined up. If you're running a bill for your bill, you want to see a bill defeated, it's a good idea to have some good spokesperson up there speaking against the bill. Now, all along the way, the bill can be amended. Let's say it gets out of the Senate. Well, then it has to go over to the Assembly. And it goes to a committee over in the Assembly. And then it has to go to the Assembly floor. And you don't introduce your own bill. You pick some Assembly member to jockey the bill, as we call it, the floor jockey. And she or he will stand up and make the case for your bill. And it's argued in the Assembly. Let's assume that it gets out of both houses. If it's amended over in the Assembly, then it has to come back to the Senate for, because it's amended. And then from there, it goes to the governor. And the governor can either sign it or veto it. If the governor vetoes it, then it can only be overcome with a two-thirds vote. Now, if you've read your newspaper, it sounds exactly like what happens in the, in the national government. So what I did was that I, I was able to introduce quite a number of bills that were successfully signed into law. And uh, I'm going to tell you about two or three of those bills. But I wonder if I might stop here. I've talked a little bit about this whole process before I get into specific bills. If you have comments or questions that you'd like to ask about state government, you could even ask questions about the national government. I've been up there and, and visited, but I, I'm not as familiar with that person as I am state government. Yes, sir. Do the fact that governors have line item veto power um, have any severe implications for the bills that you create and kind of pass through the process compared to what happens at the federal level? Yes. Uh, you, you normally very much want to, it, 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 whether it's, it's the budget, which is, as you say, can, can line on a veto, or whether it's a, a bill, you, you pretty much want to find out what's the governor's office feeling on this. Because it's pretty hard to go ahead and get a bill passed if the governor vetoes. Now, one, you know, the governor has a considerable amount of power, and you don't want to irritate him. And, so, and, and you have to get a two-thirds vote. And, you know, let's get real honest here. There's a lot of things that affect the vote. It's just human beings up there. They may not personally like somebody. Certainly parties, the party stance has a lot to do with it. If the Republican or the Democratic Party has taken a stand on the issue, that will affect the vote. Now, that doesn't mean you can't break ranks. You can break ranks. You, can, you have the right to vote. You know, if I, if I went in the caucus, First place, if I went in the caucus, I could have the right to express my opinion and try to change the view a little bit. But let's say that a majority of the Democratic caucus was going to vote for this bill, but I was opposed to the bill. I don't have to vote for that bill. So, you know, there are a lot, and there are organizations that play a big role in, in a bill, you know, some very powerful organizations, sometimes. There are individuals that corporations, the Chamber of Commerce, unions, the list goes on and on as to who, you know, and they'll generally have taken a stand on the bill. And if you've got some, one of the first things you've got to think about when you introduce a bill is, is not only who's for this, but who's going to oppose this. And you better be sure that, you know, once in a while some constituent would come to me with what they thought was a wonderful idea. And I'd have to tell them, I'd just have to say, 
I understand the validity of this idea, but that particular bill just doesn't have any chance of getting passed. And so I don't, I didn't spend a lot of time carrying bills just for the fun of carrying a bill. I want to see, you know, I wanted a bill that had a good chance of passing. Now, occasionally, you may carry an issue that you feel you need to introduce it, and you don't get it passed till the second or third attempt. But you plow the ground. That's that's a possibility. But that yes. Does education have the amount of power that um, um, that is that is claimed by it's generally its opposition in terms of uh, the ear of the governor or the ear, ear of the legislature? Well, education. There are certain uh, the California Teachers Association has a considerable amount of power because they have a, a, a number one, they have a, a large number of teachers, and number two, they have a a considerable amount of money that they can give to a campaign. Uh, certainly, corporations have a lot of power. Uh, and corporations will get very involved if it, if it impacts their money. You know, we don't have an oil severance tax in California. Most states do with it. Well, you can be sure that if anybody introduces that, and then it has been introduced, that the oil companies are going to fight that tooth and nail. So, you, 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 you know, one of the most corrupting things about politics is money. And, you know, not everybody's equal. Uh, and and uh, it does pay for, and sometimes organizations are powerful because they may not have a lot of money, but they have a, they have a tremendous influence in terms of votes. In other words, their stand will make a difference, you know, as to how people are, are, are going to vote. So, um, I would say, for instance, uh, police and fire. Their endorsement is generally coveted. And so they do give money, but they, they're, you know, they have a, a, a power in terms of their vote. So, you, you know, all of that is, is very, very, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, uh, I think <laughs> Winston Churchill once said that, um, Democracy is the worst form of government. It just happens to be better than any other form. <laughs> and that's kind of what you kind of end up uh, realizing is there's a lot of flaws in the democratic procedure. And some people ask me, well, what do you think of politicians? My sense of politicians is my sense of people in general. I met some really fine people of real integrity. I met some people that I didn't think were very trustworthy. And that's life. So, you know, you, 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 you've got to be, you know, it's just aware of that, that it's people are flawed. People are subjective. People vote for all kinds of reasons. So, you know, you can't, you can't argue with that. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of bills that I carry, just to give you an illustration. I carried a bill that was to set the way in which community colleges were funded. And fortunately, it was at a time when money at the state level was more plentiful. It's tough to do something when you, when you don't have extra money. And so... You, you, one of you mentioned about the fact that community colleges tend to be divided. Well, the first rule of thumb, they asked me to carry this bill, and they needed some additional money and a different way to fund the community colleges, and I agreed to do it, but I agreed on one condition, and that is that the community college forces would get together and would come to agreement. I didn't want to be 
you know, the uh, administrative group comes and says, oh, I want this. The teachers, the faculty wants this. One district over here, San Francisco wants this. The Los Angeles wants this. I said, let's hammer it all out so that when we finally, when I present the bill, that we've got a united front. And you know, every once in a while somebody would come to me and say, well, you know, the rural districts aren't getting as much money as they should, or non-credit needs more money, or, you know, you know the story. I said, well, go back, talk to the group. And we got the bill through, because when I finally presented it, it's like all other compromises, not everybody was happy, but everybody thought it was a pretty good deal when they got through with it. But if I had if I had listened to one group say somebody came in and said, Well, you know, the big city community colleges, they have particular problems and they need extra money. I, you know, I could give you ten different and I said, Oh, well good, I'll put that in there. Well then of course somebody else would be mad. Or they say, well, wait, that's leaving out the rural districts or whatever. I thought the only way we're going to get this through is to, is to hammer out our differences behind the doors, behind the closed doors, so that when we finally appear in front of the committee and the others, we can say the teachers can stand up, the administrators can stand up, the trustees can stand up, they can all stand up and say, Well, I'll tell you about another bill I carry. <laughs> You're sitting around the table as a result of this bill. I carried the bill that gave the California State Universities the right to offer the EDD degree. And I'll tell you why I carry it. Who do you think opposed that? You see. <laughs> You're right. It was vigorously opposed by the University of California. Because it's the first doctorate that CSU had been given the right to offer. All doctorates had been offered by the University of California. I don't mean, I'm not talking about private universities like the University of Southern California or Stanford or something. Now, I'm talking about, there are three public systems, community colleges, CSU, and UC. Now, some years before this bill, I had talk to UC about creating a community college program. University of Texas, for instance, has a great community college program. UC would never rise to that challenge. So, when Charlie Reed, who was the chancellor of California State University at the time, came to me, and we decided we would work together to carry that bill. Now, University of California walked the halls against that bill. The president of the University of California at that time, a man by the name of Bob Dines, who I happen to respect, and I, you know, I didn't have a quarrel with him, but I had a quarrel with his stand. <laughs> and, and so I worked the legislators, and Charlie Reed worked the presidents of CSU. He would get them to say, you, you call your legislator and tell them why we need this bill, why there are people who want to get an EDD degree and they don't have, uh, you know, they could go to, say, one of your private universities, but they were much more expensive than CSU. And so we carried the bill, got it through, and we signed in the law. So uh, I felt real good about that, that we got that bill through. But that was, that's a, that's a, I'm just kind of telling you a little bit about how things happen. You made it look like it's easy, but it wasn't. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Uh, I've never gone, I've never carried a good bill that was easy. <laughs> and I've carried a few bills in which I didn't win. Uh, but uh, most of the time I didn't carry a bill because I didn't think I had a good chance of winning. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe you miscalculated a bill or something. Or occasionally you'll introduce a bill to solve a problem. And it scares whoever it is that's supposed to straighten it out sufficiently that they go ahead and solve the problem and you don't have to carry the bill. So that's, that's another little technique that works. But um, 
that's that's a little bit about you you anything it's like if you're working in your own college and you want to see something happen you have to work at it it doesn't just happen what do they say there's three kinds of people people who make things happen people who watch things happen and people who say what happened <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe, if you make something happen you've got to work at it you've got to talk to a lot of people and you've got to listen to their objections and you've got to try to overcome their objections or at least neutralize their opposition or you know you're not going to you know well, seldom are you going to get a unanimous vote and and so you got to work that well i was <laughs> Getting ready to retire in 2008, I've been turned out in the state senate. I'd enjoyed those 12 years in the legislature, thought I did some good, and made some friends, and just found it pretty interesting. And the community college people came to me, they had a vacancy at the chancellor's office, and they said, we want you to be a chancellor, because you'll know how to work with the legislature. You've got community college experience and so forth and so on. So uh, I agreed to do that, but I did tell them that at, at my age, I said, I'll promise you a minimum of two years and a maximum of five. I, I, you know, I was about ready to retire. So I did that. And there are two things that I'm really proud of that happened while I served as chancellor, and I had a part in it. The first was we came up with a transfer bill, and we got an excellent senator to carry it by the name of Alex Padilla. And this transfer bill, and here's the problem that we found with a lot of, and you're familiar with this, a lot of community college people, you know, they transfer and they find it, well, we're going to count this, but we're not going to count that. I even discovered that there were two. CSU, I was president of Pasadena City College at the time. One was 30 miles in one direction, and one was about 30 miles in the other direction. One said, we'll take world history, but not the history of Western civilization. And the other one said, we'll take the history of Western civilization, but not world history. Now, that just drove me nuts, <laughs> to, to, to be blunt. I just think, that's crazy to do like that. So why don't we work out a system of so CSU and community colleges, we proposed that every community college would offer a transfer degree that would be 60 units, no more. They couldn't add, you know, sometimes you'll have some department that says, well, I think everybody ought to take X or ought to take Y. No, it's going to be a standard. You'll have flexibility, like social science, maybe you'll have maybe nine units of social science, and you can take it in psychology, and you can take it in history, and you can take it in whatever. But we said that there will be a transfer degree, and when you go to CSU, CSU will take it, and they will require no more than 60 more units in order to graduate. And once we explained that to the legislature, they kind of said, isn't it already that way? <laughs> Not that way. Sometimes people end up, you know, community college people end up with 160 units before they get out. Because this one didn't, and this counted, and this didn't. Now, it has to be the right, you know, you can't simply take basket weaving or something. Uh, you got to take the courses that are know, within the general education requirement of CSU. But if you transfer to CSU, then you can get out with 120 units. So we got that through. And then the last thing that happened had to do with what was called the Student Success Task Force. Community colleges are wonderful in terms of access, but our success rate is not as high as it ought to be. 
how can we be more successful in getting people transferred, getting them to get that certificate, so forth. So we created a, a student success task force and we came up with 22 recommendations how to improve success in community policies. The Board of Governors accepted it. We carried through a piece of legislation. Uh, it, if you turn over here at the back, you'll see it talks about that student success. The first bill was Senate Bill 1143, and we and finally we got the whole thing. We had public hearings, we had 22 recommendations, and it has really stirred up a lot of work on the part of community colleges to improve student success. And I said from the start that I thought the best thing that will come out of this is that it's not merely the state wide recommendations, but the fact that the conversation will get started on individual campuses and they'll start saying, how can we improve success? How can we make sure that more students get to their desired goal? Well, I could, you know, we'll talk about that when we talk about that. But I, I, the whole, I mean, about anything that I've talked about so far. But the, the idea was, okay, well, one is we found out we needed to, to immediately get to students when they enroll. Orientation, solid kind of counseling, getting them as quickly as possible to state their desired goal, then improving remedial education. Too many individuals end up having to take two or three semesters of remedial courses. And the truth of the matter is, there's like the Bataan death march. They don't make it through that. They've got to accelerate that. There were many other suggestions, improved relations with high schools, and the list goes on and on. But it really began, we were able to get the Board of Governors of the community colleges to accept those 22 recommendations. We didn't have a dissenting vote. Now we had some dissension within the ranks. You don't, you, know, you don't create change without getting somebody who, who's upset about it. But it, it really has, I think, done a great deal of good as far as well, I'm, I want to, uh, I, I told Dr. Curry I have to speak at Pasadena tonight at an organization, and, and I told her that I'd have to leave at 5.30, but I, I kind of wanted to, I could go back over some of this, but maybe I wanted to hear from you all of it, hear about your ideas about what's happening in, maybe in community college. Some of you in here are not in community colleges, so I'd be glad to talk to about if you're in a private university or if you're in a, a CSU or whatever, uh, you know, have uh, have experience. I, I never have. I take it back. I've never never been either a teacher or a student at CSU. But I've been I, so happy. My education was in private universities, and and I began my teaching career at Pepperdine University when I first came to California in 1962. I know a little bit about private universities as well. And was a great friend of private universities when I was in the legislature. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. This has to do with, uh, I, I don't know if it's an internal policy, but it has to do with the Chancellor's Office, the California Community College Chancellor's Office, and um, uh, a, a, a particular division, the Academic Affairs Division. And I know there are several. Many of us probably are, are aware that there are several. Uh, is there some type of internal policy or is there some type of external greater policy that uh, determines the staffing within a, a division. Mm -hmm. uh, I am aware right now that um, there is a staff of nine overseeing the curriculum approval for 112, soon to be 113 community colleges. Only a staff of nine and there's this enormous backlog. Can you shed any light on what might be going on at the state level in relation to why they won't provide more staffing for the Academic Affairs Division? I could provide a little background. Uh, I've been out of that office now. I left in September 2012, so I've been gone for about two and a half years. 
When I was in the, in the chancellor's office, it was during the recession. And we really took some hits. That, that's not just, the, not just our chancellor's office, but UC and CSU, but unfortunately they started at a much higher level than we did. We had only 145 staff members when I was there. Uh, they may have a few more now. Uh, and, um, you know, it, there, there's, there's all the uh, institutional research that has to be done, student services, the budgeting. There are, when I was there, I think we had about six or seven vice chancellors. I'm trying to remember. We had a vice president, I mean a vice chancellor of academic affairs. We had a vice uh, chancellor of student services. We had a vice chancellor of budgeting. We had a vice chancellor that had to do with um, the uh, institutional research. Um, I'm kind of forgetting some others that were there. Uh, and, and so, I, I, I would simply say that for instance, the president of the University of California, now they've cut back on it some, they, that office was, was, was uh, had about 900 to 1,000 staff people. Now they have nine universities and we have 112 colleges. Oh, yes, they've got research, and they've got medical things, and they've got a lot of things. But when you, when it was earlier said that the, uh, the community colleges have in some ways been the stepchild, that's true. Uh, yes, we can operate more inexpensively because we don't have to do research, and, and, and we don't pay for research, and, and we only have the first two years of college, and so forth. But we are the least expensive way to get an education. And, and that's why, of course, one of the reasons that Obama suggested making it free. Uh, and, and so I can't tell you, uh, you know, I, I, I can't tell you what, the per what has happened at, at the chancellor's office in the last two and a half years. I have a lot of respect, by the way, for the individual Price Harris who succeeded me, but I, uh, so I, I can't address that number. Uh, I, I do happen to know the, the woman who was recently appointed to that position. Her name is Pam Walker, and she's been in that position for about, I think, about three months. Uh, one of the problems we had, frankly, at the chancellor's office is that it's a state agency. And the people in the state agency are paid less than what people are paid normally at the community college. At the community college. I was already retired, so I had a retirement income. But I didn't get paid as being the chancellor of the system as much as most community college presidents made. And, and I, I didn't sit around and gripe about it, don't get me wrong, because I, I did it because I cared about it. I didn't do it for financial reasons anyway. I was I already retired, <laughs> and I said I, I was looking forward to retirement, but I thought really I could be of some service, and I, 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 I did have the advantage of, of being able to work with the legislature, so I could at least pick up the phone and call a legislator, and they didn't say Jack who, uh, you know, they, they knew who I was. But that's all I can tell you. I can't, I, I, I can't tell you about that. But some of those individuals, and they're generally dedicated, hardworking people, are civil service employees. Now, other question, yes, sir. Um, within the student success task force, I noticed one of the recommendations was the need for all segments of education in California to collectively defined um, college readiness. Um, how does this, I think that's a great idea, but with so many agendas with K-12, 
moving, moving towards common core, the different assessments that community colleges have, the Cal States have. How does that conversation start, A? And then B, I noticed that the recommendation did not include the UCs at all in that component. Well, part of the reason that, that you can't include the UCs is that they have a constitutional protection. And I know why that protection was in there. Early in, in, the, in, the, in the history of the University of California, there was political interference. You know, people would, maybe they didn't like the politics of one of the professors and say, we ought to fire that person, you know, a legislator or something. So they gave them constitutional protection. But that means that when I said we worked out a deal with CSU through the legislature, we could do that through the legislature. But we couldn't do it with UC. We, we were prevented by the Constitution from doing it with UC. We did it through the legislature because it's very difficult. You have nine, and you have 23, I believe 23 CSUs and 112 community colleges. Well, you know, if you just say, well, well, we're going to have an agreement between Cal State Fullerton and Fullerton College. Well, what about somebody from Fullerton College who happens to want to go into forestry and wants to go to Humboldt State University? Well, then you try to work out a deal with Humboldt State University. Well, you can imagine how difficult it would be to have 112 colleges and 23 CSUs. So that's why we went to a statewide system. It made sense. Now, I'll tell you what they do in, in the state of Florida. In the state of Florida, they even have common course numbering. So if you take English 101 at Miami-Dade College, that's, the, my, yeah, that's English 101 at Florida State University and at the University of Florida. So they have perhaps the easiest uh, transfer system in the nation. We didn't bite off something that big. But we did buy it off this other idea. But uh, I, I, I think, frankly, Common Core is a movement in the right direction because it is a movement. It can be very hard, uh, and, and I think what you run into is a lot of faculty opposition. Uh, you know, well, my course—I don't know. It's the same as the course they teach over there at uh, Coastline College and. And so on and so forth. Sometimes you can't even do that in the same district. <laughs> exactly. I mean, one of the one of the things that just kind of drove me crazy. By the way, don't be don't be under the illusion that the chancellor of the California Community College can snap his or her fingers and and things will happen. I didn't have all I had was the bully pulpit. I really didn't have the dirt. I didn't have anything to do with selection of presidents, for instance. Well, the Chancellor of the California State University does. The University of California president does. Those are things, but that's the way our system is. Our system is very decentralized. Do I think, for instance, I thought, I thought it, it's just really kind of crazy that even in the same district, sometimes you had uh, different um, assessments. So somebody would go from, say, uh, in, a, in the Los Rios district, would go from, say, Consumers River College to American River College, and they'd be assessed differently. Now, the trustees at Los Rios said, no more of that. So all four of the colleges in that district have the same assessment. And that has to, that would be one of the reforms that I think ought to be undertaken. Now, just a moment. Did you want to ask something? Or make a comment. I, I didn't mean I have that. a lot of uh, questions for you. One is uh, talk a little bit about the future of California Community College and the latest baccalaureate degree. Mm -hmm. Where is that taking community college? What do you see 2025, for example? Okay, there's a lot of problems we have with community college. Well, let me tell you why I think community college has a very bright future. Let me give you about five or six really good reasons. One is we have open enrollment. Now, that means that any person who has a high school diploma can enroll in a community college. That's desperately needed because 
we can't write people off simply because they didn't do it well in high school and we hope they will. Secondly, we have career technical education. Those are vocational opportunities that we need in our society, whether it's becoming an electrician or a nurse or a firefighter or any of those things. That's another great strength. Number three, we are a, a, an institution that is inexpensive compared to, you know, we've got the, uh, the price advantage on others. And so that's, that's something we've got to maintain uh, in, in some way. So uh, that's another one. Four, we are the place for adults to go more than any other place. It's convenient. It offers evening classes. The, all, the idea that was characteristic of colleges 50 years ago that the average college student is someone who's a recent high school graduate and is going to go to a residential college, that's not the typical college student of today. Now, that's a great education, but there's no way we can afford to, to give everyone that kind of education. So. Adults are going to ask for more and more education. So those are the kinds of things that I think have a peak. Now, what about baccalaureate degrees? I think those baccalaureate degrees of a practical nature uh, can work. They have in, in a lot of places, like Florida is one place, uh, that that works. Okay, let's keep going here. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the ongoing discussions that we've had in this class um, concerns the use of part-time faculty versus full-time faculty at the community college level. And uh, you know, I'm pleased to read about some of the reported advantages of full-time faculty, including retention rates of students, improved graduation rates, um, accessibility for committee work around the college. But it seems as though purely fiscal arguments are heavily in favor of utilizing part-time faculty. And so maybe as a, uh, as a former uh, community college president, you can, oh, and also from a different perspective, a kind of a, higher statewide level, if you can talk about sort of the differences in sort of overutilization of part-time or full-time faculty. You're exactly right. It's a fiscal issue. And when the state of California wants to have more full-time faculty, they should give the community colleges more money. I remember when AB 1725 was passed in the late 80s, I believe it was, they began to give us money. And I was at Pasadena City College at the time, and we began to add more and more full-time faculty. Then, you know, in the early 90s, suddenly the funding dropped off. Well, that made it more difficult than to do that. I mean, that's that's what the real that's the real problem. I mean, it's, it it'd be wonderful if you say to a community college, well, and, and we do have a requirement of a certain. When we get more money, we have to add more full-time faculty. But if you say to a college, you're going to get the same amount of money, but you're going to have to, you know, increase your full-time faculty by, let's say, by 20. You know, when you stop to think about the salary, the benefits, and all the rest, you're looking at about probably $100,000 per faculty member, maybe more. But, I mean, I'm talking about health benefits there. All of a sudden, you're saying to a college, you got to spend $2 million more dollars in a tight budget. That's where the problem is. If the state of California feels like we need more full-time faculty, then pay for it. <laughs> that's being blunt, but that's what I'm telling you. Okay, any, any other questions? Yes? Um, uh, a local community college, uh, a while ago, I don't remember what it was, it's a little hazy in my head, but basically they, they came up with uh, uh, the idea that uh, they could basically sell a spot in a, in a classroom for at a higher premium than the normal going rate in order to kind of push people through. I was wondering what you thought about that. Especially with the, well, for those of us who have been around for a while, we've noticed the cost of, of, the, of a unit at a community college, you know, in, in, in relative to what it used to be, exponentially explode in a way that, that might be prohibitive for some students. What, you know, what you uh, well, uh, I had real questions about that because of the precedent. Uh, I, I felt like they had to make sure that if they did that, and it was very controversial, and, and I think Santa Monica College was the one who 
first threw the idea out. Uh, the problem with it is that, and the argument was, well, we, we can get those who can afford to pay that, and it'll open up more spots. But I, I think that one of the great strengths of community, number one, it's four to six dollars a unit. That's that's the least expensive community college education in the nation. Secondly, about forty percent of the students can uh, can qualify for our board of uh, governors waiver, which is the, what's called the bond waiver, and that means that you don't, you don't have to pay the tuition. Excuse so me, what was that, that percentage again for the bond waiver? About forty percent. Uh, of the full-time students uh, 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 qualify under the bond waiver. And I'm, you know, you're, you're talking about, you know, I haven't uh, looked at the statistics yesterday, so, so uh, but I'm giving you, a, 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 we have a very, in other words, we're, we're, we're pretty generous. Now, one of the questions that I used to work with at the, uh, uh, at the legislative, uh, Area was the price of books. That's a whole lot more. A lot of times, a lot of times, a student ends up, particularly if they get a bond waiver, what really hurts them is the price of, of textbooks. And we need to put a pressure on textbooks publishers on that issue, as far as I'm concerned. And we did, we did some things in the in in, in the legislature. Um, you know, number one informing a faculty member sometimes isn't fully informed when they say well I'd like to have these three textbooks they don't realize that they've suddenly uh, you know, $250 or more uh, you know so that's not the so okay oh, oh just one yeah some very yeah. expensive yeah well see I'm out of touch <laughs> okay what well, I think we'll move also by the way to some electronic solutions to this. That'd be another way to help that out. Well, I, I have about three minutes left. Three minutes, any, any uh, final question? Final question. Well, it's been a lot of fun talking to you. And uh, uh, you, you, you don't have to agree with everything I said. It's just fine. I'm sure you have some reservations. But well, that's I, just, I think it's amazing that in the short three years, at least, in the most challenging years of California State, you know, financially, that we are at the helm and we're able to pass two very significant transfer the student success bills that's going to have tremendous impact for the years to come. We actually have two students right now in this other cohort doing dissertation on that transfer bill. <laughs> the effect of the uh, first, uh, first wave that come over to the CSUs. I thought you might be interested in knowing. I, I would love to read about it. Yeah. I, I was finally interested in that bill and, and pushed it. And I had a, and, and uh, Charlie Reed was also very helpful on the bill. And I had a, you know, once you, you throw that out to the public, they don't realize that's this transfer problem. They don't realize that it's costing the student time and money. It's costing the state quite a bit of money. If you can, say, move that down from 150 units to, say, 140 units, stop and think about how much money that saves a student, and think how much money that saves the state. It means you can educate the same, uh, more students, you know, for the same amount of money. What would you say was the secret in getting through the CSU Academic Senate? Was that everybody thought that was an impossible hurdle? The legislature. And when the legislature said you got to do it, you sort of have to do it, you know. <laughs> and that's, that's the reason we went to the legislature is we knew that, you know, that that, you know, I'm a senior faculty member. And I teach, let's say I teach Shakespeare. And I just really don't think that course they're offering down at Cypress College and Shakespeare is good. So we're not going to recognize that. That doesn't cost me anything as a faculty member. 
In fact, I may get more students in my class. So the student is not in a position to make the decision. And I'm, I'm not trying to speak out against, I'm not trying to castigate faculty in general. I'm just saying that's kind of, we've got to sometime sort of say, well, let's look at what's in the best interest of the student. And maybe just doing that is, is going to cost the student a lot of money and time, and it's going to cost the state. So I think, I think those are issues that, you know, the public has to, has to take an action on.